think about the, the difference between like a boxer who you were in the, you know, was one versus the other one. One boxer did some of the work because he's supposed to, and you know, he was, he was doing the meetings, having the conversations, but he's still a boxer, right? Then there's a the boxer that he was up in the morning at 4 a.m. running, and he got, you know, he was out running at 10 o'clock at night. He was getting lifts in by himself. When nobody else was present, when his coach was gone, his family was gone, he's getting push-ups in. He didn't cheat in his meals. He could have cheated, but he was at home eating the right meals. When he steps in that round, you know, that game, that, that fight, and it's the 10th round, and it's the two of you, and someone's tired, he's not coming from the energy he has because he has none. Just like you, he's coming from the willpower that's deep inside of him that's rooted in this is who I am to win this fight. There was far too much I have done that you never saw that I am not going to bear down and quit. These, they, they ratchet it up, and it's, it's so much deeper than just what you know and what you've uh, accomplished, what you've learned, like the mindset you have. It extends deeper into your soul of you. You're watching a man and a woman's heart on the table because they've earned it in the dark, and you can't take it in the light. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. This is Jeff Lerner, your host. So thrilled, as always, to be here with you for another episode. And I am so grateful today to be joined by Mr. Anthony Trucks, uh, former NFL player, um, creator of a really amazing program that I've, I've been, that's for, where frankly most of my, my pre-conversation homework has been, is researching this movement that he's created called Identity Shift that is so cool. And I'm so eager to ask him all kinds of questions. He's also an American Ninja Warrior and uh, all the things I wanted to be in high school when I wasn't a very good athlete. But uh, Anthony, I'm, I'm so grateful to have you on Millionaire Secrets, man. Thanks for being hey, here. Hey, I'm, I'm happy to be here, man. I, I, uh, you know, it's funny. It's, whenever I get to go on the podcast, I actually get like, I have an upwelling of joy because I'm excited to, to say whatever needs to be said that hopefully helps some people. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, man. This is going to be great. Um, so gosh, your story is just so rich with, you know, the kind of material that I know makes for great conversations. Um, you, you were um, put into the foster care system and, and I was reading in your bio and, and maybe is, I hope that's an okay place to start, but I was reading in your bio. Um, it didn't just say you, you know, landed there. It said you were given away into the foster care system. And, and I'm just going to say right now as a preframe for the whole conversation, the fact that you are, you, you essentially now do professional identity work. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm reaching, but I kind of connected those dots. Like you were yeah. given away, put into foster care, and now you help. Obviously, you went through a, a process yourself, and you help others find their, their identity and kind of who they're destined to be in this world. Yeah. Um, first of all, actually, maybe I'll start there. Like, am I right? Am I connecting dots that do connect? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I, have a, I have a long, weird relationship with identity that, that, that stretches far past it, but it's, it's kind of always been part of my life. So yeah, three years old, given away. So my starting of the world was I don't know who I am, where I'm at, who I'm with, where I fit. So uh, I mean, someone who hasn't been given into foster care, obviously it's like, oh, I don't know what that feels like, but it feels the exact same as I don't know who I am or where I fit or what I'm supposed to do next, what my purpose is. So my world started in like a really dark place. That's kind of always been this back and forth up and down relationship with identity, which has led me to do what I do now. So did you, um, did you, were you able to re retrace or reconnect or kind of make sense of it all? I mean, if you, gosh, yeah. we're diving into the deep end here, but like, did <laughs> you reconnect with your birth parents and any of that craziness? Yeah, I got some crazy stories there. You know what the thing is, if I hadn't navigated, I would not feel comfortable talking about it now. Yeah. And I don't do it from a stance like what I coach. And I don't do it because like, oh, I got a cool story, bro. Let me go talk about it. It's genuinely, I created a very specific method and the process to guide people through it. Because 
So I did a lot of it reactively, the identity work. Like I was given away. I, I was put into an all-white family, grew up in a really poor environment. Uh, you know, we, we got to the point of like I was horrible at sport and then got good at it. So I navigated those identities. Then my mom got sick. And then I went to college and I had a kid at 20 years old, met my real dad at 21, didn't talk to my, my biological mom for a long time. She came out of the woodwork and hmm. all these weird things. Then I go to the NFL and the NFL is not for long. So my third year, I get hurt and come out. And I have the, all these different parts of my identity being woven in in ways that I was not prepared for. And I'd never really have unpacked my childhood stuff, you know? So when I get out of football, the thing that gave me self-worth of football was now ripped from me. So now I'm battling with, I don't feel confident as the football player. That's gone. I'm now married. We have two more kids. So I'm like a bad father. I'm not present in the marriage. That all goes to crap. Uh, you know, I, I still am battling with this, like, where do I fit? I have a, a real mom that's, you know, non-present I have a sick mom I have a foster dad I have a real dad who's kind of floating around now but dude man it's just always been my battle and then like life takes a horrible down shoot and it takes about five five years to climb out of a hole and then realize like a really unique strength that I have as a human that I didn't even see somebody made me aware of and then happen across an area where I could figure that this is actually a world I can help people like I didn't know this whole world existed six years ago I was yeah. like oh People do this for a living like this. I can tell my stories and help folks. And so I turned it into, here's my story, which turned into, how do you do that? And like to turn into, oh, here's how you do it, which turned into research and, and studying and then unpacking and being very clear about who I am and vulnerable, we'll call it. And it turned into what's called the shift method, which guides people through the process proactively, not always reactively. Yeah, I, I, you know, I have a concept in, in my training um, and inside my community, which is called Entre Institute, where we, it's basically like an educational, you know, institute for entrepreneurs, people that yeah. want to start a business. Fight, it, it, but you and I both know being an entrepreneur is so much more than just starting a business, right? It's oh, yeah, like it is. Finding yourself and your mission and your drive and your passion and what that thing is that's going to yeah. make you get up and have to work 10 times as hard as most people just to even get to the starting line as a, as yeah. an entrepreneur. Right. And, mm -hmm. but, and, and in my, my world, in my work, we, I talk about something called your success character. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to find this character, this way of being that you can, maybe you're not in it all the time, but that you can step into yeah. every day if as needed to, to really execute and perform at the highest level. And, and to me, that's, Actually, I'll, I'll share with you how I define it because I think Please. you may you may really geek out on it. But it's I, I like this. I go into like the Freudian construct of the id, the ego, and the super ego. Yep. We're like we all have this super ego Structure. character in our mind, right? It's our idealized self, and that it's about pulling that into your reality. So it's not just a, a hypothetical ideal in the mind, but it can actually start to manifest and. And, oh, yeah. and be the ones driving the, the car in your life sometimes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and for most people to connect their idealized self, this, this magnified best version of themselves as like, that can actually be who you are. That's Should part be. of you already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to make it part of your identity. That's mm -hmm. actually how you unlock people's greatness. So I, I just want you to know I'm, I'm a like mind here. Yeah, you are. But, but how did you, I mean, you, you kind of said somebody pointed out like, Hey, that's, that's your superpower. But yeah. like, how did you operationalize that and really become like an identity authority? That's just such yeah. a powerful thing. Well, first off, I had to know what I was talking about. So I spent a lot of time in Eric Erickson's work, Freud's work. Yeah. There's a lot out there. Right. So oh, you went through Erickson, the sta stages of psychosocial development. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. dude some fun stuff, dude. And I, I had to, cause I was like, if I'm going to be an authority on this and the thing was, it wasn't my first thought to do this. It was actually at a whole yeah. business that was based around called trust your hustle. It was a company on trust your hustle. It's not a cool, it's cool, a quippy little name. Right. But right, it was like right. somebody, somebody sat down and what you're talking about is the aspect of find your character, which a guy named Todd Herman calls alter ego, which is a very unique aspect of like activating that person when you need it. And, and if I go back to looking at like my life and all these things, what ends up happening for a lot of people is they, they don't quite understand, like I call it the ideal identity. Who do you have to be to be able to embody and, and live out tactically and strategically this human? And, and so when I look at the, the work I do, it kind of came to be as somebody sitting there chatting with me about my life story and you called it the character. Um, this guy was very clear named Ethan Willis. I'm sitting in this mastermind with Brendan Burchard and Russell Brunson and Dean Graciosi up in the woods in Wyoming, uh, Jackson Hole, and we're all chatting, eating cookies by a fire. And it was everybody's turn. Like, it's just like a group of like 15 of us. And like, hey, share your story, what you're doing. So my turn comes. 
and I'm the guy nobody knows in the group because I'm definitely not the level of these guys, but somehow somebody thought I was a good fit, so I'm there. And I tell my story and what's going on, and one of the guys, granted, I've done this for the last like three years at the time, he goes, I don't like it. I go, what do you mean you don't like it? I've been working on this for like three years. He goes, nah. And this is what he tells me. He says, in the world of this, this speaking, you know, thought leadership, entrepreneurship, there is a message and a messenger. He says, the messenger is the person's the tactics, the skills, the charisma, the, the ability to do what they do, to talk and share. But if you don't have an aligned message, it will fall flat. And then sometimes there is a message the world needs, but you are not the messenger. And he says, when you figure out what your message is as the messenger, you lock in. And in that conversation, the guys were like, he goes, he goes, I don't know. He says, all the trust or hustle sounds cool. He's like, but what I want to know, how did you navigate being a foster kid and not end up in prison? Like 75% of inmates yeah. are from a foster kids. He's like, how did you get past the being the, the you know, the, the, the black kid in all white family? How'd you get past the almost getting arrested in high school? How'd you get, how'd you get in the, the meeting your real dad and the football identity, losing that, losing your marriage, losing your mom. He's like, how are you here right now? That yeah, was yeah. the thing. He's like, one, I think it might have been Brendan goes, yeah, there's some identity of you. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, no one's talking about identity. You should look into that because that's definitely a thing that resonates with you as a human. So sure enough, I go, you know, going down the little path and I dig it out. And the more I dig into the work of it, I'm like, oh, crap, I've gone through all of this. And I'm a weird anomaly. Like, I don't really exist uh, on paper. You wouldn't, if you, someone put on paper that this person exists, you'd be like, oh, that must be a fictional character. Not a superhero, but like a fictional character. And that's what led down the path of me unpacking it all, making sense of it all. And I would say the authority didn't come because I chose it. It came because God put me in front of a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I figured, all right, well, how can I take all this stuff I've learned and I've experienced and make it something where people can apply it to their lives to be able to make it work? And so I, I, I do it the way I actually do it. If you look at, um, you know, Fogg's, uh, BJ Fogg's work, or if you look at um, James Clear, the identity stuff comes from the backside of habits. The more, it's like you yeah. are what you do, right? So what I look at is most people have habits, but they don't realize who they're becoming with the habits. So they're being someone who's becoming someone, but they're doing it without a plan. So what I do is go back and say, well, let me do two things here. You're, you're in this school of thought, the hero's two journeys, right? That whole concept. Right, right. I was like, well, at the end of the day, when I'm, when I'm achieving something, uh, I have to be transforming inside the whole entire time or I'm not going to achieve it. Or I would have already had it. At the same time, I can't transform if I haven't achieved something. So what I do is go back and say, all right, well, let's, let's focus where people can already see a, a result. And I teach them how to achieve a very specific thing through very strategic planning, which NFL taught me how to plan on a world-class level, how to execute in the face of pain and fear and like possible failure, which you do every single damn play on a football field. And then how to be disgustingly consistent and disciplined and through that, with a planning of who you're going to transform into, we help people make a shift to their identity. Man, that is, that is so cool. And I, I, this, is, this is a show about you, not about me. But I just I have so much that I personally connect with, good, uh, to, connect to with, with what you're saying. I mean, even in terms of what I'm doing literally right now in my life, yeah. it's, been about, it's been ultimately about the, the maturation and completion. Well, it's never complete, but the getting more intentional about the development of that identity and that character and figuring out who I'm, who I'm supposed to be in this world. Mm -hmm. um, it occurs to, I mean, you, you mentioned Erickson and I, you, you saw me light up, right? I, I'm a, a super nerd for, for Erickson's work. So like you were put into, you were given away into foster care at three years old, right? Yeah. So that's, that's right around the time that in Erickson stages, you know, we're dealing with issues of like shame, yeah, or, or you're developing, you know, the autonomy versus shame and the initiative versus guilt, right? Like that's all that three to five range. Yep. So you, you know, by virtue of the fact that you grew up, you became an NFL athlete, you, you, you clearly already had some direction, like you weren't, I mean, you didn't flounder and go off the deep end. Could have, um, close to it, <laughs> but I kept it, I kept it in line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or at least you, maybe you didn't get caught or it didn't, I don't know, you, lucked, you didn't have the, the, the oh, price I get, tag. I get arrested, man. I get 17 years old, I was arrested for breaking the cars with some, some dumb friends of mine just because I was doing stupid kid stuff. Okay. I, I, mean, I grew up in a, a really a diverse, all-white family, and it was like, it was just dysfunctional, dude. Like, my mom doesn't really keep in tasks when she was sick. My dad was working all day long. I was not running around doing dumb kid stuff and lending myself in jail one day. So, but at the same time, I got to think that, I mean, do you feel like you developed some, some strengths and some skills oh, yeah. from, from that, that, you know, independence or maybe, oh, maybe, yeah. maybe even neglect, whatever it was. But I mean, yeah. 
What, what, what came from that you that know, was a positive? I think it's a crazy thing. It wasn't positive is what I did with it. I think if you think about a sword, right? A sword uh, can do harm or it can do great stuff. I can, I can chop up you know, a meal for someone with a sword. I can chop somebody in half, right? right? So I was given a tool. And what I did with the tool is what was kind of the thing that was beneficial. I think it, the reason a lot of kids that are like me and foster care that end up in prison are because we end up exercising and using that tool for the wrong purposes, right? So I was very charismatic. I was very communicative. I, I would go out on a limb and do whatever I wanted. I, I wasn't afraid of the world because the world had already done a lot to me. So at this point, like, what else can you do, world? Like, you beat me, starved me, tortured me in foster care with these different houses. I was putting shopping carts, pushed down hills, forced licked the bottom of kids' shoes, like, heinous stuff, man. So by the time I was six, I'd done all that. So by the time I'm, like, you know, 17, like, I got a different kind of edge. Like, I'm just going to do what I do. Right. And, and the thing is, is... I did learn a whole lot about how the world worked. And at one point in time, I was going down the wrong path. And thankfully, uh, I fell in love with football. I fell in love with what the sport gave to me, which was a sense of like belonging and self-confidence and self-worth. But I sucked at first. I had to earn that. Like I really had to earn it past the point of what logically made sense because I wasn't good. And it turned into something, right? But that was one of the things that kind of kept me clean and kept me going. But it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't like I had this lesson I learned it was positive. It was just what I chose to do with it. So you say you sucked at football. Yeah. I sucked at football. Yeah. I, I'm curious. I mean, do, do you feel like, well, I guess, tell me what you mean when you say you sucked at football. Like, I mean, what, what was that effort like to not suck anymore? Uh, the, so there's, I guess, the, when I say I sucked, like, I got I told by my teammates I sucked <laughs> in, the, in the middle of practices. Let's put yeah, it that yeah. way. I was bad. Uh, you know, I had some talent I could run, but we all know just because you can, you can move your body doesn't mean you're a great athlete. There's a lot that goes around it. And to be honest, this was the first like massive identity shift I made. Huh. I had identified as the foster kid who didn't belong, didn't matter. Mom is sick. I checked out two years of being bad at football. I was done. And I, I sat in this class, Mr. Howell's English class in a portable Freshman year of high school, after like the football season was over, I was checked out, dude. I had a parka. I would come to class, put the parka over my head, sleep. One of these days, this girl is talking to somebody else, and she gives me a really cool gift that I wish everybody else could get. And it wasn't that she gave it to me on purpose, but it was through her words. And she's talking to somebody else, no clue I'm listening. She says, the reason I'm so bad is because I'm in foster care. And the gift was hearing my excuse for checking out out loud. Mm. And it was a really stupid excuse. It was in my head. I remember, I gen, I'm not even making this up. In my head, I remember thinking, oh, like that, that's a dumb excuse. Like, because of that, you're going to get in trouble. And then, I, then it went inside quick. I was like, oh, like, that's what I'm, I'm making up. That's why I'm checking out a football. I'm, you know, I'm making, I'm just making an excuse. I was like, dude, this sounds, this sounds like me. And I remember going home and that, it was like 15 years old. And my dad, like he is a welder, had welded this dumbbell. And I would sit at the corner of my bed and do bicep curls. I had a mere opposite, like a small one. I would get up and like curl and look at myself. Because I'm a 15-year-old boy. You do something right, like right. that. I remember, dude, I go home and it sat with me all day. And I'm, this, I, these moments are seared in my brain like all the rest of my stand up. And I look myself in this mirror. And I look dead in my pupils. And I say, Anthony, you're going to be great. And that was, that was the moment, man. That was like, I got to do something. So you ask what I did. I asked, well, what does a great football player do? What, what does that person do? What, and so I, I crafted in my head this plan of like, I'm just going to go and do what they do, run routes and lift weights and that kind of stuff. And then I had to go do it when I didn't feel like it was me, the imposter syndrome, because I do things. And you see guys, teammates like, Ant, what are you doing, man? You're still going to suck next year, right? The world comes at you. I just kept executing. And what it was was the consistency compounded. And it got to the point where I wasn't just this guy that sucked trying to do what great athletes do. Dude, Jeff, internally, I was a great athlete. I was going to defend that with my blood, my sweat, my actions, every single practice and play. So when I came to school the next year for football, dude, you couldn't take it from me. Like, I am catching this ball. You are not catching it. I am making this tackle. You are not tackling me. I get to win this play every time because I earned it because that's who I am. And I earned it in the dark. It's the best way to explain it. And I realized this one statement that I got to get tattooed somewhere. I'm seriously going to do it. And here's a statement that everybody should grasp, I think, when it comes to identity. It's what you create creates you. The process of going through the ugly, arduous consistency, executing past the pain, having a plan you trust, planning big in the first place, it's a creation process. Like when I'm like Michelangelo making the, the David, right? You don't finish that thing without having blisters and bad hands and messed up and then tell yourself, I'm a sculptor. I'm not some guy who sculpted a statue. I'm a sculptor. 
when I was done with that creation, I had always been creating the internal sense of who I was now through the pain, the fear, the, the, all that consistently. So when I showed up the next year, I was a monster. And that turned into going to varsity my sophomore year, a scholarship, NFL, and then so on. What you create creates you. I, um, one, of my, uh, one of our top executives at Entra, actually, he always says, he's, he's almost saying the exact same thing. He says, first you create your habits, then your habits create you. Same, yeah, it's just like elongated, but same stuff, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like your, yours, yours says the same with, with slightly fewer words, so we'll, we'll give yours the nod. But no, it's, it is so true. Um, and, and I gotta, I, one thing that stood out to me so much in, in what you said about how you, you heard somebody else make an excuse that was proxy for your excuse, right? And you're like, oh, that's, that's dumb. Yeah. Um, and it's so funny. So you do all this identity work with people. I mean, obviously, I assume you, you confront people's excuses very oh, often. Totally. Oh, immediately. Yeah, we, but, we, have, we have processes where I do it, they do it, and we have somebody else in their life do it. It's a very unique little thing that they hate doing, but the, it, it's gold, bro. It is gold for the change. Have you ever come across an excuse that wasn't, at some level, kind of a dumb excuse? Um, or, or essentially the, an excuse that was imbued with, an, with inappropriate significance by the creator of the excuse. Yeah, I mean, it's a natural part of it. You know, it, I think people have to find ways to make an excuse that makes them feel better to go to sleep that night without like hating themselves. Right. So we'll make excuses that allow us to stay in the space of our alignment so we don't have to be faced with the fact that it sucks. And some of our crazy excuses, I have had people genuinely tell me when it comes like business, I'm like, you got to do video. Like part of your structure, oh, yeah. you do video. Oh man, I, I can't do it. I'm not good. You know what? I'm going to wait until I'm good at video to do good video. Sorry, you're going to do what? I'm, I'm going to wait until I'm, I'm good at video to do video. Uh, how does that work? How do, I, I, seriously, I was like, how exactly are you going to get good on video without doing video? And so the logic is, is always skewed or people will give me off the wall excuses and they'll try to confuse me. And then I ask this question. I say, great, here's what I want to I find out. The person you want to be, right? Yeah. Um, what do they have? They got car, money. Okay, cool. They got a good business. They're happy. They're giving back, thriving. Great. Okay, would they have that excuse be good enough to stop them from doing their thing? And I sit and let them sit back and go, oh, no. Because the reality is, is we're not just trying to get you to do something. We're trying to get you to think about when you become the human who does that, there's no longer a decision. It's just who you are. That's why success gets easy for certain people. I'm sure, Jeff, if I sat with you for a day, there are things you do that are so second nature to you that would stress me out the thought of doing them one time. And it's the same for everybody else in different aspects of the mm -hmm. world. And people are wondering, hey, what book do I got to read? What course do I got to take? Like, you got to use what you got in your head already, but you aren't the person to use it yet, or you'd already have at least some shred of success. Mm -hmm. And when I get people to grasp that, the difference is not what you know, but it's who you are with what you know. The simple question of what would that person do? It changes, it ratchets, like it, it makes certain things feel like, oh, like I tell people when they're like, oh, I'm so busy, my schedule's crazy. Okay, cool. Um, would Oprah look at your schedule and say it's crazy? And they go, oh, well, maybe not. All right, okay, right, now. Yeah, that's a good one, yeah. The reframe, right? It's a little reframe, but now they go, oh, all right, now how do we get efficient enough to get this stuff in so Oprah could go, oh, damn, you're killing it. Yeah, that, that's a great, oh, that's a great frame. I love that. Um, and, and to get... And, you know, that's a really great way to have the right heroes is who am I trying to impress with what I'm actually doing in this world? Not who am I putting on a pedestal that, mm -hmm. that makes me feel, you know, like I'm in the right place down here because they're up there. You know, so a lot of people kind of use hero or celebrity as like a almost like a I can't reach it thing. Yeah, yeah, it's like the story, you know, it's, it's, a fan, it, it, it's a fantasy, right? It, stay, it belongs up there in the fantasy realm. It doesn't apply to little old me, but, but rather to actually try to connect to your heroes and be like, who is the hero that I'm trying to impress today? Could be, yeah. Yeah, I, li I like that a lot. So, okay, so, so biographical stuff then. You play in the NFL. Yeah. You said only three years. Yeah, I got hurt in my third, yeah. What did you hurt? My left shoulder. I tore two of my four rotator cuff muscles and then – after that, man, I already torn the three in my right arm in, in college. So by that time, I'm a linebacker with a broken wrist, two bad shoulders, and low back issues, which are like the f four areas, the three areas that you do not do whether you're playing linebacker. Those are like red flags. So right. after a while, man, no team would pick me up without a waiver. A waiver means if you get hurt with that, no one covers it. So my agent was like, dude, you can try, you can do it, but if you hurt your back or your wrist, you're screwed. Like what if you go hurt your back and you can't get another job for the rest of your life and no one covers that? Yeah. You're screwed. So couldn't take that gamble for my family. 
Yeah. Huh. Okay. So you're what, 20, like 25 or something, mid 20s? I think 26. Yeah, 25, 26. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it was 25 about three months before my 26th birthday. So I got to, I got to really try to, try to empathize with that person. You're 25. Yeah. You, you, you kind of grew up lost, so to speak, law and from an identity standpoint, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, kind of chaos. You find football, football probably takes you through the next 10 years, mid, you know, what high school to mid twenties. Yeah, now it's ripped away. It's gone. And, and, you know, my guess in three years as a, as an NFL linebacker, you probably made decent money. Like you made good money, but it's That's like, you're money. not, you're not like done. You're not like, ah, oh, I'm sweet. I'm going to go buy an Island and just no. live out my days. Right. Not even close. So you got to figure something out. Yeah. And you know, to, you know, the same, the thing you hear about a lot of athletes is once athletics is ripped away, it's like, they got, they got nothing left or nothing mm -hmm. else, nothing they're committed to. So, so yeah. How did that unfold for you? My guess is it was kind of, kind of hard. Oh, very hard, man. It's a, uh, I don't know. There is another way for it to be great unless you've played for a lot of years, but also even guys that have a good chunk of money, when you don't know why you're getting up each day, it makes it hard to get up each day. I get depression. I, at one point I was like, if this is my life after football, I'm cool. I don't want any of this. It just all mm -hmm. fell apart, man. Cause yeah, I had some money, but I, I put into a gym business cause I had to find another reason to feel great about myself again. You know, I would, who was I without football? I was nobody without football in my head. A way that I'll ache in this is to anybody who's had anything happen in life who's listening now where you've had a relationship fall apart, a business, you know, tank, uh, maybe you lose someone in your life. Uh, what ends up happening, or you lose some money, right? I have this apple. Think of like an apple. And the apple is a fruit of your labor. You are this apple. And the apple falls off the tree and it hits the ground. And we feel like this fruit, right? And when something falls off the tree, we feel like we fell off the tree. Football for me, I fell off the tree. And then for a little while, that, that fruit still got some, you know, ability to be eaten. You can right. take it to the grocery store, I can eat it, it can go in your house. But at a certain point, that apple starts to get rotten, it gets brown, it gets decrepit, it dies. And that's how I felt, that apple. I felt, and we all do, we feel that way when it goes bad. And for a lot of my years, I was there, man. I, you know, my marriage fell apart, my wife stepped out on me, we'll call it. Simple, clean way of making something that was really difficult happen. Um, you know, I was a bad dad, my business was always up and down. I was looking at bankruptcy nine months into the business, dude. Like, I was out of shape. Everything that made me me was, was kaput. The, the rotten apple had done its job. It was dead. Yeah. And then you get to 2014, my mom passed away. My adoptive mom passes from MS. And I, I had this final spark of, I got to figure something out, man. This cannot be my life. Like, there's got to be more. And I, and I started doing some work. And the best way I can explain it is having this realization of all of us who've had the apple fall off the tree. You were never the fruit. You were always the tree. Always. So I didn't realize that this fruit, when I looked at the fruit and I thought it was a fruit, well, I stopped tending to the roots of the tree and I stopped tending to the fruit. So all the rest of the fruit died. Of course, if football died in me, why am I going to take care of the tree and help my marriage be better and my, my parenting? And it all died. And when I realized that, man, the tree of Anthony created that fruit of football, created that relationship, created that, dude, it was like, all right, I got to figure out how to fix this tree, Right. So I started giving nutrients to the roots. I started giving more life to the rest of the fruits. And in fact, at this point in my life, I believe I've created more abundance on that tree of my life with fruit than football ever could have given to me. And, and so that was a very difficult level. It was a good probably five years of fog, of crazy, of, of up and down. And I mean, not so stuff, man. But at this point, I realized like, oh, like they just most people who are struggling with those moments, the dark, dark moments, it's a matter of they just focus on the fruit. They haven't looked at the tree. And if you could do that, you could do some great things with your life to create even better, brighter fruit for your world. I, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a student of ideas. And I like to think I have a pretty good discernment when it comes to ideas. I'm going to give you, not that you need any rating system for me, but I'm going to give you a big fat gold star for that fruit tree idea. <laughs> Thank you. You man. just changed my world, man. That is, that's incredible that you fall off the tree and you think you're lost on the ground going rotten and you don't realize that you are the tree. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm stealing that. That's so powerful. I, and I, I just, Oh, enough said, but like, thank you. Thank you for yeah, that, that visual. Welcome. That's just so powerful. And I think about my life, I think about when I, you know, I lost a marriage. I've lost two marriages. I, I lost a, a career. I was a really committed, passionate musician, but I, it was untenable because I was just too poor and personally dysfunctional. And 
Yeah. Um, I don't, now I play music every day as a hobby, but it's not a career, right? Like that was, I guess, a, a fruit that dropped off my tree. And yeah. Um, yeah, so much, man. That's so, that's so great. So one thing you said that uh, I caught, and, and I thought it was very cool the way you said it, is you, you mentioned what happened with your wife. You said she stepped out on you, but you said, which was really just kind of a pragmatic solution to the problem, which was, you said, you're, it sounds like you're kind of owning it. Like, oh yeah, there's a lot of ownership, but that's, I mean, we talked about going deep here and I'm, I'll happily go deep because these are the real parts of the world, right? The business stuff is good and all that stuff's great. But even with business success, I had business success. After all this, I was signing quarter million dollar contracts with large corporations, single, I would vacation trips. I'd like, you know, I don't have my kids for the weekend, four days. I'm taking trips to Bahamas with strange women, you know, just hanging out. And that's a whole story that needs to come into itself because I am not a fan of that. And I'll, I can tell you why, but here's what took place is I get to this moment where the marriage falls apart because I'm spending so much time. I'm at the gym, dude, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And at this time, when, when I find out she's having the affair, dude, like it was all her fault. It, how dare you? How could you? What are you thinking? You should have told me. And there's a couple of things that come into play. We were 16 when we got together, right? We, we didn't know who the hell we were. And we had three kids. We started making this life. And you know, the idea of like, who, who am I without this person? It finally started creeping in to her first, right? She had the, the, the curiosity. I, I just got lethargic. I just got complacent, like, ah, she's there. She's never going anywhere. So I became a bad husband, to be totally honest. I was not present. But at that time, oh, I didn't think that. How dare you? Look how good I am. Broke me. Like, broke me inside, man. Because growing up in foster care, I didn't have my family. So now I'm now putting my kids in a position out of a dad like I didn't. I felt yeah. like I was ruining their lives. Uh, man, the, the, the business was tanking, all this stuff. And what happens is I legit one night drive off and I'm like, please tell my kids who their father was. It was a very like a, a heavy night where everything hit at once. And I was, I was like the pain, I couldn't stop and I'm done with this. Thankfully, I didn't do anything, but it started this kind of role of just a really deep uh, survival mode, just getting by. At one point, dude, I, we were separate. I was living in a 500 square foot studio apartment behind the front desk, my front desk girl behind her parents' house. Like I was in a little, and I'm talking, my kids were on an air mattress. I was on a twin bed. I mean, I could barely put clothes in there. And you said the front desk girl you're talking about at the gym. My employee. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, who, you know what I'm saying? Like, I am yeah. not living, I'll get a 9,000 square foot gym and I got a, 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 a bedroom the size of the office. You know what I'm saying? Like, this yeah. is where my whole house is. Dude, not killing it. And it just, you just, you just get by. And then I got to this point where, and this is really where the switch took place and where I think everything kind of came out of the whole is I got to this moment where it was 2016. I'd gone through the ups and the downs. And, and the, this is the marriage, we'll call it marriage rekindle story. She went through her own realm of just craziness. And in 2016, I woke up and I was, uh, I'd gone to Russia in 2015 for a presentation, got paid well to go there, met some, some girl, didn't even speak English, a, a purely lustful physical relationship. And she come, I fly her out for New Year's 2016, come to California, come hang out. You know, it's a Playboy guy does. And I have, you know, I've got a son, I've got two, I got, you know, two sons and a daughter and I'm just doing my thing. And I remember I wake up on New Year's day, 2016, and I go into the bathroom, I wake up and I look at this girl and I can't, I can't talk to her. I, I don't have anybody to talk to my friends. I don't have any friends nearby. She's here. And I just, and I like, I, I roll over, I go into the bathroom and look in the mirror and it, it's the best way I can explain it. It was like the same kind of moment as when I had when I was 15, but I, I deeply had a shame for the man looking back at me. Like this was a person I would never want my daughter to be with. I would never want her to be around. I would never want my boys to act like this or see me. My mom would never approve of this and my God wouldn't let me into heaven. I was, I, when I was in the NFL, I didn't even cuss. I was close to my faith. When the marriage just fell apart, I fell apart. And I went in a big, deep dig. Like this is where I started figuring out, dude, you're the common denominator in all your problems. What is going on? Mm. And I dug and I dug and, and I uncovered a lot that I didn't want to uh, want to hear. Uh, myself, I had a lot of deep conversations. I swore off women. Uh, you know, I was just like, I'm done. I'm keeping it myself. And what happened was I got to this point where I, I kind of pulled the shame from my ex. I did. I made my, my, my kind of reconciliation a sense of like, look, you made a really crappy choice. That should not have been your choice. But I understand how you got to a position to feel like you needed to make one. And I was part of that. If I was a present husband or I did my things, you wouldn't even feel like you were in a position to go for your needs because she didn't do what she did to maliciously hurt me. She was just trying to find something for her that she couldn't get from me and she'd asked for and I wouldn't give, right? So I felt that and, and it kind of gave a space for me to tell her 
I get it. I'm going to stop placing the shame on you. You got to deal with whatever you did and your choices, but I'm not going to keep making you feel bad about it all day. And it pulled this little kind of like box off her that was holding her down. And she stepped into some space on her own to find her own faith, to, to grow as a, a woman while I was doing my own work, completely separate. And then it got to like, uh, was it August? I think August, September of 2016. And she's like, hey, I want to take the kids away from this area. I just, I, I got to get away from this crazy. We live in a real small townish, and it's kind of like, I don't want to be around. She's like, but I don't want to be together with you. So you get a room, all get a room. We'll go out there. We'll spend three weeks. You can work from wherever you're at if that's cool with you. I was like, cool, I'll go out there. I'm still talking to another woman right now. Still, like at this time, I'd kind of started talking to somebody. So I was kind of doing my thing. And, and we get out there. And the best way I can explain it is I got to meet someone for the first time that I'd known for 16 years. Vast different heart, different woman, different perspective. She'd done her thing. I'd done my thing. And we weren't there for the kids. And, and I mean, you got to think, it's just the two of us in a foreign country. We don't speak Spanish. And there's three kids running around. So what do you do? You sit and talk with somebody. And dude, we went deep in conversation uh, to, to a depth of like, I, I felt her as a, a grown woman for the first time. And there was no talk at that time of a relationship. We get back and I'm about to go on a date with somebody. And the night before the date, she comes over is like, hey, I got to talk to you. I'm like, okay. She goes, I want to try to make this work again. I was like, hold on. What are you talking about? I'm going on a date tomorrow. She's like, yeah, I know. That's why I had to do this. I prayed on it. And I felt like if I didn't say something, I'd forever regret not saying something. So for me, it's like, I obviously had this, how, I don't know if I could do that again. There's too many people that, that know what happened that were supporting yeah. me. They'd be pissed to have me take you back. And I went on the date anyways, and it ruined my date because <laughs> it was always in the back of my head. Long story short, we come back and somehow or another, man, we, we, we decide we're going to take a shot at it. She makes the call. She needs to make the people she has to make and she gets their blessings. And that was, you know, four years ago, as of a month and a half ago. And at this point we have, did an incredible marriage, man. I, I would go through all that 17 times again to have what I have now. Uh, and it's the root of why I love what I do. Like I've, I've done the things I'm teaching people to do. I'm not just saying I got this cool concept. I've fixed my marriage. I'm a present father. My business runs smooth. I'm in shape. I do, I've crossed the finish lines that I'm telling other people to start running the race for. And it's the only way I could feel confident talking about it because I got an intimate connection to so many weird parts of things I've, I've navigated. And that's where kind of my stuff came to life, man. So great marriage, happy life, and I get to give it to other people sometimes. Well, congratulations, first of all, on, I mean, having run those races. That, that's a awesome story, man, um, about, your, uh, about your relationship with your wife. And I think it's, you can hear the love and the respect in the way that you tell it, where it's, it's you're not pulling any punches. It is what it is, matter of fact, but it's all just cloaked in this forgiveness and this heart and this gratitude for where you guys are presently super cool i um i so i'm, I'm kind of you know it's podcasts are fun right like one person's <laughs> talking the other person's listening going like well i hope i have a good follow-up question you know right but like <laughs> so in the in the middle of while you were talking my mind starts going to this place of like okay try, try to fit those together and then i'm like wait no just pay attention just don't 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 take risks right but screw it i'm saying let's take a risk Take a risk, man. So you gave the tree metaphor, which you can, yeah. you know, you can, you can tell I'm a big fan of. And then you talk about marriage. Yeah. I'm wondering, and again, I have no idea how this is going to work. I'm wondering if we can try to like merge those two ideas because as an entrepreneur, as a man, as a yeah. provider, as a creator, as a leader, the tree fruit thing like makes so much sense, right? Like yeah. I'm the tree what I, what I create and cultivate in this world is the fruit. Like it's, yeah. and, and so I got to nurture the tree, right? Yeah. And then, and then, and then you, and then you invite someone into that. Yeah. How does that, how does that assimilate, man? Help me, help me wrap the tree fruit metaphor gotcha. around the pairing of two human beings. Oh, there's some, there's some depth here. So this is actually one of the, the lessons inside of my work I do. It's called Roots and Fruits. Uh, the first foundational piece is that you're going to love it apparently because this is, you're, you're grooving. So here's the thing I look at. If you think about a tree, we just talked about the tree concept, but life has storms. Things come to blow us over. You know, business fails and you got to keep things stable. And so what I found is like, the, if you ever look at some of those pictures that have like an old, old tornado went through, just one big tree between rubble, you know? Right, right. How does that tree stand? Well, the tree stands because the tree has deep roots and the deep roots eventually allow to, to be able to, to thrive and do well. That fruit will produce fruits. Uh, that tree will produce fruits at some point. So what I realized is we got to have roots and fruits. The roots, in fact, are your faith, family, health, friends, and emotions. 
So do I have faith in self or a higher power, which is either one, you have a faith in something you don't believe. Family, do I have a good depth of like, really strong rooted family base? Do I have good friends, the family I choose? Do I have good health, so my body can do things? Do I have emotional control in heightened moments? Do I go crazy, am I capricious, how does that work? If these are all deep roots, and we label them zero to 10, zero is like, I don't got a control, it's not a good deep root, or you know, I got a deep root in that area. When my roots are stable, I can produce fruits. I can feed the nutrients because I have a good faith, family, friends, health, and emotion. And so for me, most people, they lose sight of trying to make those, those roots deep. If my relationship is, is always in the rocks, no wonder my business didn't do well, right? I wasn't looking at taking care of what I had to do to make sure I had a good deep root in the marriage and the relationship in that area. And what's crazy, when those things are good, like for me, they're good now. My faith, I'm solid. My family is solid. My friends, I have great friends. My health is good. My, my, my emotional control, I believe, is very sta stable. I have weird conversations in the racial world now. I'm out public, people calling me bad words, and I'm like, ah, eh, whatever. I, I can control that, right? But here's what it does. It produces the ability to create fruits. Lots of fruit, right? So it's career. Do I have a career I love? finances? Do I have money I love? Do I get an education from life every day? Do I get to escape and explore the world that I, that I don't have in my, my backyard and go see it? And do I have a purpose? I call it lift, life inside for triumph. If my roots aren't good, I can't do any of this. I'll have a job that, that doesn't make me money. I'll have no money. I won't learn from life. I won't be able to take trips or they'll ruin the trips or I won't have a purpose. And so for me, when I look at how the two come together, people don't take a snapshot of where they're at and think about how they can improve these areas. Now, for me, the snapshot, it's just to see like a, the balance sheet of a you know, business. Where are you at right now? Right? What's going on? And so what I'm looking at is like when you do that, okay, take a look and take account of what's going on. And then if, if I'm able to, which I tell people to do is just look at it every day. You think of one thing you can do in each area to improve by one depth or one fruit. You don't look at making it 10. It's just, it's unrealistic. You can't make them all 10s. And trying to do that gives you a, an added stress that overwhelms you, you shut down. So I tell people, just write down, what can I do to improve my relationship from a, a six to a seven? That's all you got to think about, write on a piece of paper. And then you put them all down, and then every day, look at it. It subconsciously triggers you to start thinking about these things in the middle of your day. So for example, if your relationship's on the rocks, like having that vision in my head when I'm going to get a break between podcasts or between calls, or between meetings, as opposed to going and playing a phone game, I'm like, what my wife is doing? I'm going to give her a call send her some flowers, right? These little nuanced things that start subconsciously seeding in and now they adjust. So the tree, essentially what I've done is I've said, hey, I'm gonna go back and tend to the tree now. This is how I'm going to do it. There's a lot of ways tactically around that, but baseline, I tell people to go back and say, how do we make a better piece of fruit than that one that fell off? Because our marriage is not that old fruit. Our marriage is on that tree, it's a fat apple that, that it's waiting to fall, but it's not. You know, It's still getting fed by the tree. It's not that dead fruit over there. And I don't want that dead fruit. We have something vastly different. So when I went back and said, screw that apple, let's create a new one in these ways by tending to the roots and fruits, it's made an amazing life so far. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's I'm glad I asked, man. I, I stepped into some fertile grounds. I, uh, you, you, while you were speaking, it made me think, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but it's so powerful. I just, I, I feel like re, restating it, just sharing it. So, you know, the biosphere, right? When they built that self-contained ecosystem that, you know, we're supposed to use a, a learning laboratory for nature. Mm -hmm. So I've heard this story that the first, that when they first built the biosphere, you know, they got everything right, the alkalinity in the, in the soil and the water, the hydration, the atmospheric, you know, moisture and all this. And that yet, but all the trees kept dying. And they couldn't figure out why everything's perfect. Why can't we get any trees to take root, right? And stay alive. And then finally they figured out it's because I'm curious. Have you ever, have you heard this? I have not. I'm waiting. I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat, man. There was one thing missing from the biosphere. There was no wind. Mm. Trees. Interesting. Have to have wind mm. to push against. Mm-hmm. It, they're, they're literally designed to flex against wind. The back and forth, something about the back and forth and the sway agitates them to grow properly. Wow, that's pretty cool. And I, you know, for obvious, it's obvious why somebody shared that and made a metaphor out of it. But I just, I felt like sharing that with you because with the tree thing. Stealing it all day. <laughs> it's so good. It's so apropos for you. Yeah. Um, 
anyway, that's, that's really, really powerful. Um, and, and congratulations again on, on just and not only working through the stuff and coming out the other side, but like being willing to talk about it. You know, we, a lot, people go through these, these messy parts of their life and they think that it becomes like their dark secret or this like hidden source of shame. You know, I, I think this is something they say in AA, like your mess is your message. It is. Yeah. I mean, that's to me that those are the most valuable places to go to. So, so as we're kind of, you know, heading towards the, the end here, like, what do you, what do you say to the person that is hearing all this identity? You know, like, look, listen, man, I just, you know, I'm stuck in a job. I don't love the job, but there's no, no, you know, I don't have any other prospects. I got all these, you know, call them excuse. You'll tell me their excuses, but whatever bullshit, they're just my life and da, da, da. And so, and you're like, you're like, man, listen, the, the job's not the problem. The circumstances aren't the problem. Like there's some, there's some opportunity. There's an opportunity here to do some identity work, right? Business, like yeah. how do you connect to that person that's, man, they need to hear it. And man, they're dug in against it. Like what's yeah. your strategy? It's everybody, man. That's, that's uh, cause nobody likes to hear that they have to improve. They want to hear an opportunity there. Right. Right. And even I frame it as like the opportunity is to access a new level of life that that's waiting for you when you choose to do it. But here's what I found to be the issue. Uh, we have these things called egos and ego is EGO. Everyone's greatest obstacle it stands in our way, man. It's uh, and we protect it because the thing is our ego is designed to protect the identity with the actions. If I see myself as a great football player, my ego will protect that identity by getting up early and doing my lift and eating right and lifting weights and what reading the playbook. Right. Even if I don't want to do it on top of that, if I happen to be, I don't know, a drug dealer or I happen to be a druggie, a drug addict, I'll protect that by saying, but you don't know how hard it is. You don't get it. I'm addicted, right? I'll find ways to protect it with the ego to be able to be in alignment. And so the first thing, obviously, it's a, a vast array right there. You'll have the people in between who I run into who come into my work, and they're doing great things. Some of them are millionaires doing great things, right? But they have another level of something they want to achieve. And it's, it's hard because as long as the ego will protect where they're at, it won't let them have the opportunity to improve. So the first thing is, you kind of got to get to the point of like AA will say, admit you got a problem, right? That's the first stage of it. It's not, it's not like it's magic because you can't do anything if you don't give yourself permission to improve. And so the person right now listening, yes, you may not be a drug addict, but you might be addicted to the way of life you're living, which has allowed this life to be what it is. And that isn't always the greatest if you want something more. If you don't want anything more, dude, love it. Enjoy your life. I love you because you're happy. But the moment you're telling me you want something more, and you keep telling me that it's an outside reason. Oh, the industry is this and the, you know, I, have the, I don't have support or I don't have the time or whatever it is. You're just trying to protect the identity you have because you don't quite grasp that until you give up that piece, you're not going to get the next piece of what you want. And so the person listening now, which this is typically the person who I'm marketing to in the world of what I do, it's like, look, you have something you want. If you were the person to have it quite logically and literally you already have it by now. Yeah. You just would. And if you don't have it, that's, oh, there's things that I want that I don't have right now. I want to host a TV show. And I know the way that I'm running my life right now, because if I'm in season of dad, I'm not doing the things to do that. But I can admit that. And that's okay, right? Yeah. The, the moment that you can get yourself to that space, you become myable to the world, you'll, you'll do damn near anything. Because it's also now you're not attached to a failure being a, an attack on who you are now. It's who you're trying to be. It doesn't diminish who you are. I'm taking a step in this direction to be this thing. And if I fail, cool. It was expected. I'm not that person. Let me try again and try again and try again. Let me create. And the creation process creates you. And then all of a sudden you stand up tall on that far side. Yeah, it seems like a really empowering idea. And, and I know from my own work how much people resist. And I know from my own life how long and how hard I resisted. But like yeah. when you finally accept that like you are the common denominator, that actually means all the things you want to do become actually so much more achievable because you've essentially taken all the power back. Yeah. To make them do. doable. Because if, if it's actually not about your identity, if it is actually about your job or if it is actually about what town you live in, or it is actually about, you know, how you were born or who you were born to or whatever, if it's about those things, okay, I guess you're screwed, right? So help us. Yeah, but it's not. And, and, and what the thing that people resist the most in many ways is actually the lock or the, the key that unlocks what they yeah. want the most. Yeah, it's right there. It's so weird, powerful. right? Yeah, it's, so like, it's always there. It's always the edge of our fingertips. 
but it, most people will not accept that there's something that they got to do past this point. And it's even worse in our world nowadays with social media, because now people have these personas they create online that, that they have to try to make the world think is real. When the reality is that it's not that great behind the scenes. And because you're stuck because of what you show and you won't let the ego down, you never do the work to get really successful. So you look successful, but your bank account doesn't, your relationships don't, your health doesn't. But at the end of the day, like if you want to protect that, by all means, I'll, I'll tell you what I can tell you. If you're willing to give up this, this little ego thing, you'll change your life. If not, then just get used to what you have. Yeah, you said something earlier. What, I, hope you, I hope you remember it and you'll restate it. It was something like you were, you, your success happened in the dark. Oh, yeah. It's what you do in the dark, man. It's, uh, yeah. it, there's always that statement of what you do in the dark uh, comes out of light, right? And, and I think it, we hear that in a negative way all the time. You always do. You hear like what you do that's bad in the dark is going to come to the light. Same thing happens when it comes to what you do positive, dude. If I'm in the background reading the book and doing the work and filming the things and editing things or having the conversations, when I stand up in the light, I'm not coming to you in, in, with just what you see. I got a baggage or a backpack full of all these tools. Think about the, the difference between like a boxer who you were in the, the, you know, was one versus the other one. One boxer did some of the work because he's supposed to and, you know, he was, he was doing the meetings, having the conversations, but he's still a boxer, right? Then there's a the boxer that he was up in the morning at 4 a.m. running and he got you know he was out running at 10 o'clock at night he was getting lifts in by himself when nobody else was present when his coach was gone his fam was gone he's getting push-ups in he didn't cheat in his meals he could have cheated but he was at home eating the right meals when he steps in that round you know that game that, that fight and it's the 10th round and it's the two of you and someone's tired he's not coming from the energy he has because he has none just like you he's coming from the willpower that's deep inside of him that's rooted in this is who i am to win this fight there was far too much I have done that you never saw that I am not going to bear down and quit. These, they, they ratchet it up and it's, it's so much deeper than just what you know and what you've uh, accomplished, what you've learned, like the mindset you have, it extends deeper into your soul of you. You're watching a man and a woman's heart on the table because they've earned it in the dark and you can't take it in the light. I got nothing to add. That's that, that we're ending on that beat, man. How can the world come get more Anthony trucks? They come get some y'all. Uh, you can go to, uh, go to Anthony trucks.com. If you want to, uh, to message me directly, just go to text Anthony.com and you can, can join the kind of text community of people I got in the world. Uh, and if you want to find out what identity you are, go to www.sloworgo.co. You'll find out who you are and how it ties to your success or failure slow or go.co awesome man uh, is that is there a is like a survey like a questionnaire well, quiz i can it's a quiz yeah you get to find out which one of four identities you are between uh, a dabbler a defender a dreamer or a doer or five levels of a doer and uh, kind of where you sit i i would uh venture to say you're definitely a pilot uh but there's an astronaut that could be a little bit higher level oh 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 something else to shoot for cool i'm gonna go take that on honestly anthony this has just been amazing i'm so grateful you came to Millionaire Secrets. I know you've, you've got another place you have to be very quickly, so I'll wrap with that. Thanks again. This has just been amazing. Welcome, man. All right, and to all of you out there, watchers and listeners, thanks so much. You're the best part of Millionaire Secrets. You're why we do what we do. Take care. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.